Okay, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and this is Community Matters, and my guest today is Julian Gorbach of the uh, Journalism Program at the School of Communications, UH Manoa. And we're going to talk about journalism, of course. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, whether the press is doing a good job. The title of our show is, uh, what is it, Gaslighting and whether the, whether the Press is Doing a Good Job, whether the press is covering the right issues. Welcome back to the show, Julian. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Jim. It's great to have you here. And I, you know, we get into these conversations before, during, and after the show that I really enjoy. And so we never know which, which way we're going on this. <laughs> but the general proposition is that um, this administration is gaslighting the press. What does gaslighting mean in that context? Well, so that's a, um, that's a reference to uh, a 1940s film noir movie. Is that right? Yeah, uh, which is about a guy with a, a new, you know, newlywed couple, and the man is trying to drive the wife crazy. And so he turns up the gaslight uh, in the middle of the night um, in her room so that she thinks that the house is possessed, it's haunted. Um, and it's been a while since I saw the movie, but essentially that's the idea is that he's trying to drive her crazy and um, sort of bully her into just kind of believing whatever he says. It's the ultimate deception. Yeah. Um, and, it, you know, just to undermine somebody's confidence, because if you... If you convince somebody that they're crazy, uh, then they'll abandon the truth. They'll let go of the truth. So it's, oh. a, it's, a, it's a way to attack the truth. Yeah. Um, and so if somebody challenges you on the facts, then gaslighting is to, to yell at them, to do whatever you need to do so that they begin to question their own sanity um, so that then you can proceed to, to tell them what's real and it's what's it's, not it's, real. It's, it's pernicious in the sense that you're, you're putting the truth aside. You're undermining the truth in every way you can. Well, you're attacking the truth. And you're attacking you're, the person you know, who would like to, to decimate support the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, you, and you're doing it, if you do it to the journalist, the journalist is a proxy. You're doing it to the audience. I mean, and, and then the, this is, you know, when people talk about Russian propaganda and active measures, the, the, the concept is, is, is that the Russians have been interested in this. You know, it's been part of a playbook there for uh, I don't know how long. I mean, Decades. I'm not an expert yeah. on Russian propaganda and don't yeah. want to claim to be. But, but the idea is that the, that the Russians have this um, objective of, of getting people uh, not to kind of believe everything they say. The more immediate objective is to get them to question any, everything so that everything is up for grabs. Which uh, means you, 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 you undermine the truth. Yeah, you and kick there up is no enough, truth. Truth, enough dust so that, that people exist in this sphere of uncertainty and, and, and now you're ready to start coming in with work. Isn't this exactly what's happening in the world today in this country? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we saw it. I mean, I think that the, the most um, sort of conspicuous early example of this, uh, I, I mean, it's been going on for a while uh, since Trump campaigned, but the most conspicuous early example was the inaugural um, thing, and uh, who, who, I forget his name, the, the, the first press secretary who was lampooned Sean Spicer. on, uh, Sean Spicer, um, who was lampooned for doing this on, uh, you know, if you remember the thumping of the, on Saturday Night Live, the thumping of the podium and all that, that was sort of a parody of the gaslighting that he was doing, because when people said, <laughs> Well, this wasn't the largest crowd in history, and actually the, the, the turnout was small. He just yelled at them and tried to just scare them into just accepting whatever he said. And it's, it's kind of gone on ever since then. Of, um, I mean, people do it. You know, what's interesting is you have all these little Trumps online, and you'll find that, that individual supporters will get on, I find that they get on social media and we call it trolling, but a lot of times it's also gaslighting. They, they know that what they're arguing is, is not a, um, an honest debate, but they'll, they'll, they'll come into it and they'll try and, you know, they'll try and own the libs, right? They'll try and um, uh, just through various tactics, just try and knock over the debate and, and own the facts. Why? Well, I mean, there's a reason that fascists attack the truth. Because it's it's will to power. I mean, you know, there there have been fascism nowadays. A word we're we're bandying around a lot, and that's because, um, you know, when when the original fascists in, in Mussolini's era rose to power, um, they did not have a, a specific 
agenda. There wasn't a specific ideology written down in, in Mussolini's Italy that, of the fascist party that said, here's what we stand for, here's what we don't. Um, and so people have, have ever since tried to kind of fill that vacuum in with fascism is this and fascism is, th is that. One of the earliest ideas, and this has been challenged for a variety of reasons, was that, that fa fascism is actually a lack of ideology, that what it is is it's a sheer drive to power using any and all means available. That sounds right, actually. And I think there's a, you know, there's a lot uh, to be said for that. Um, there are problems with it because uh, um, it, it doesn't tell you a lot. I mean, I, I don't really remember all of it, but, but there, there are issues why scholars have challenged it. And anyway, the, the, but one thing that, that flows from that, the reason I bring it up, is that um, a fascist wants to attack the truth because whatever... Uh, ideas they may have. They want the power. So if you kind of push people back, the journalists back and the people themselves back and kind of accepting anything, then you set the then facts. You can, then, you, then you have total power. You, yeah. you, you are the facts. Information is You power. are the truth. Yeah. Whatever you say today, yeah. it's, it's like in 1984 when one minute we're at war with Oceania and then we're the next with the, <laughs> with the other country or that, fi that famous final scene where they say, how many fingers I have up? I have, I have five fingers up, right? And, you know. Uh, <laughs> People agree. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's kind of, I mean, even yesterday in the State of the Union, was it the Times that went through it and, and fact-checked it? They found there were all these inaccuracies and, and uh, exaggerations, even in the State of Union, well, right, even I, after all the lies we've heard. Well, I mean, and then, and then you just get, you know, there's, there's all these layers of it. So we've talked about the fact that I teach news literacy uh, at UH, and when, we, when I began teaching that in 2006, 17, spring of 2017, it, we had this idea of, of fake news that people were not, they didn't know how to read the digital landscape and just the complex 21st century landscape we have, the social media landscape, their phones, everything, the way that we get information now. And so we need to help these people out of the wilderness. But when I, by the time I returned to teaching this in the fall of 2018, it, it occurred to a lot of us that there's, there's an entirely separate concern, which is what do you do when people are aggressively attacking the truth? That's not the same thing as just people wandering around lost, yeah. right? It's yeah. it's uh, or people not being digitally literate. Yeah, you know. So so I think like probably a lot of the literature that you're going to see starting to you know emerge out of this is um, what are they what words do they use? Just deception um, or um, disinformation actually is yeah. is, is the term. A and back then to misinformation measures, is yeah. a different <laughs> is a different thing. Yeah. yeah, but I think like in terms of like if you were to Google and see are people really studying this or how to educate, it's I think disinformation will be one of the major words. But you know, it's something that I've just really begun to I mean, I don't see a lot of good information about how do you teach students about that? How do you teach the public? How do you teach the journalists to deal with it? And um, so I've been kind of developing some ideas uh, about so it. Sounds like the Washington Post's uh, thing about uh, democracy dies in darkness. Um, you know, darkness means you don't know what the facts are. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I think if you take the facts away from us, this is a, this is a great loss for, the, for democracy. Right. Not to have correct facts that, that are agreed. Um, and so what's happening here in this administration, maybe it was happening in other ways before, but what's happening in this administration is we can't agree on the facts. The facts are being attacked. Fake news and uh, Giuliani, uh, alternate facts, and incredible that we, we can't agree on the facts. How then can we make uh, conclusions and recommendations and actions in government or in, in the social sphere? But I want to I want to connect that. I want to connect the gaslighting yeah. thing and the disinformation thing well, to how I, the press reacts to that. Right. Well, so you know, one thing I've been looking at is um, I, I guess there's there's both there's the two components. Is one how does how does the journalist react to it? But also it's like how how does the consumer of information, just the member of the public, the citizen, react to it? And um, I've, I've been working with an undergraduate who's really smart uh, named, I'll give her name, uh, uh, Miko George. And we, so she's very interested in us trying to do some kind of a paper that we can share uh, with other teachers about how do, you, how do you educate, whether it's the journalism majors or the professional journalists, et cetera. 
And one of the ideas she suggested is maybe we should look at this in terms of uh, the field of psychology and people who, this is getting back to the idea of the movie, Gas, the original movie, um, which is called Gaslight. Uh, I don't remember the original. It's a, it's a, it's but a, it, it's a gaslighting in the context of the movie is a psychological trick, isn't it? Right, yeah. So, so, so she was looking at, okay, or she's beginning to look at, like, in the field of psychology, what's the therapy and what do, what do we teach or, or, or talk about in terms of people who are the victims of abuse in domestic relationships, who become sort of captive to their partner's ideas and their undermining of their self-confidence and, and their sense of sanity. Right. So that's one road we were looking down. But then another one that came up is I'm looking again at, um, there was a movie about this recently, but the whole case of Deborah Lipstadt when she's a Holocaust um, historian, and she had called out uh, a, a British, basically a, a neo-Nazi named uh, David Irving um, for Holocaust denial. And so David Irving took her to court for libel, and this became a famous case, and now it's been a movie that came out in 2016 called Denial, um, with Rachel Weisz playing Deborah Lipstadt and everything. and. Um, I, f I found that was relevant because I watched the movie again and I noticed that the whole defense team, they were on the defense, right, because they got sued for libel. And in England, David Irving sued them in England where the libel laws are tougher. And so it's actually the burden of the accused to prove their innocence, unlike in America. But the, the, the strategy of the defense, or the attitude, I guess, of the defense was uh, Deborah Lipstadt and her team refused to engage David Irving in debate because they felt like he was essentially gaslighting. Like one of the things, that, and, and this comes out in the movie, um, is that the defense team, David, uh, Deborah Lipstadt wanted Holocaust survivors to go on the stand to say, yes, the Holocaust. It really survived. happened, yeah. Yeah, it really happened. And they would, the, the attorney, her attorney, would not allow these Holocaust survivors on the stand because they did not want David Irving to be gaslighting them, to be attacking them on the stand. And, you, you know, because these, these traumas happened decades earlier. And so to try and trip these people up and humiliate them or undermine them uh, would have been relatively easy to do. They certainly would have been sure vulnerable. they were elderly anyway. And another, th another aspect was that they, they, uh, the defense attorney uh, the, the, the barrister who actually uh, was in the trial room and, and you know, c conducted the trial refused to meet David Irving's eye because he would not give him that respect. So when they took him on the stand and they said, like, you're not a rotten historian, you're a bent historian. <laughs> in other words, you're not making these mistakes unintentionally, you're making them deliberately. He did not look at David Irving when he said that. But, but the most interesting thing to me about it was, was Deborah Lipstadt's point about engaging, she refused to engage David Irving and these people in debate. She refused to go on their territory and, and basically be vulnerable to this gaslighting. So how, how could she make her case? Well, her argument was, I am not, th this is what I found interesting, and I, I want to look farther into her insights to, to say more, but the thing that was most interesting was she said, I am not against the First Amendment. To the contrary, I am against people that, that are coming in to undermine or twist our kind of liberal uh, interest in having debate and in having free debate. So uh, they're free to, spot, to, to talk, but I don't have to engage them. I don't have to entertain uh, their, because they're only trying to deliberately twist and manipulate the discussion, and I think it's that's pathological, but it happens. Yeah, so I think there's something there in terms of both hmm. the professional journalism strategy and also is that we're not, it's not against the First Amendment or against, you know, for that matter, to a lot to of... To engage. Yeah, when, when, when we know that the, that the effort is a deliberate effort to sabotage honest debate. Yeah, oh yeah. By yeah. the way, this footnote is there was another, there was another book years ago uh, called QB7. Uh -huh. It was the same plot line, and it happened in England. QB7 stands for Queen's Bench 7, a courtroom. A courtroom. Um, and it was the same kind of thing with a Holocaust survivor um, having the burden to show the Holocaust existed. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting how, how similar they are. Anyway, uh, you know, it strikes me um, that this kind of 
gaslighting is what it is that you describe, um, is similar to the whole thing about balance. So Trump comes up with a completely irrational and un implausible and unsupported statement of some kind. Um, and that's on one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is something we all know. We can take it by judicial notice. It's there for sure. Everyone knows this. And yet he's arguing against the fact that everyone knows. And he's using this fake news technique. And this is, this is kind of gaslighting in public. You talk about psychology, Julian. There's two kinds. One is the uh, clinical psychology involving you and me and just, just a couple of people in a room. And the other is involving 300 million Americans. There's this mass psychology. That's what we're really talking about. So you can advise one person how he deals with his own psychological reaction to this. But you really, you have to tell 300 million people how they, all of them, have to deal with their reaction to this. And I think there, a lot of them are caught in it. And a lot of them we can never reach. We can never clear it up for them. This is a big practical problem well, yeah, for I mean, government. Well, there. Okay, so there's a lot there to unpack in what you're talking about. I mean, for one thing, if you if you want to focus on the psychological aspect of it for a second, um, I'd say that th that if you're dealing with somebody who is, let's just say, because this has happened, that you're dealing with a demagogue or a leader where there's there's actually malice, there's malicious intent, like Adolf Hitler or something like that. Um, you, you often have two dynamics going on. One is that, um, like psychopaths, maybe a very small part of our population, but they they tend to be a very powerful influence, um, far beyond just their, uh, just on, on the world, right? Um, whether they're gangsters or, or some psychopath who rises as an attorney or whatever they do, a lot of them turn out to have for all kinds of reasons, this ripple effect on so many of the rest of us. And, but because there's such a small portion of the population, uh, you know, a lot of what motivates a, a psychopath is in all of us, a lack of empathy, which all, everybody has to some degree, an, an inability to kind of feel sorry, maybe sometimes at appropriate times to the degree that we need to. But the extreme to which a psychopath has it, there, you know, people who study psychopaths almost study them as like a different species. Because when you study their brains, like the, the, the size of their amygdala, they actually scan differently than us. And so when we, you talk about balance, when we try to relate or, or talk about what someone who's actually a psychopath is doing, a lot of us have difficulty understanding what they're really doing. Mm. Because it's so far from the way that we interpret mm. reality. Well, let's assume and that but, for but a then there's a way. Then there's another side of it, which is that to people that are leaning on the spectrum towards psychopathy, you know, mass psychologists, people who study mass, like going back to like Eric Fromm of Escape from Fe uh, uh, Freedom from the Hitler era, have, have sort of suggested the idea that to, to those of us that may, may fall more towards the psychopathic spectrum, that may be more self, whatever, it's like a tuning fork. You know, when they hit it, for people that are going that direction, they respond. So we talk about like Trump's base. I mean, to some extent, you know, he's, he's sending out signals that resonate on some kind of a deep emotional level with certain people because of these reasons, because he's, he's getting at impulses that they have. He's like communicating with us. He's communicating to some very fundamental aspect of human nature. Yes. Um, and not a good one, a primitive aspect of human nature. Yeah. And, and he's Hatreds. called the call of the wild, if you will. Yeah. Right. So uh, on, the, on the question of balance, though, um, I mean, the problem for the press is they see these lies and they know these truths. And they are gaslighted because they, they come in and they say, well, you know, maybe he has a point. Let's give him credit for making this statement, uh, even though it may be somewhat questionable. And, 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 and then, you know, let's test on whether the truth we know it to be is really the truth. So I think, I think a lot of journalists, a lot of news organizations get compromised by this age-old need for, quote, balance. And, and the agenda goes off the tracks that way. I mean, isn't it better for the journalist to be able to say, I mean, this is the modern, you know, mixed opinion and fact kind of, uh, an, honest, an honest broker journalist who, who calls the shots the way he sees them. So, well, you know, he said that, it's not true, this is what's true, and this is the way I'm going forward on my reporting here. I am not going to give him equal time. He's wrong. 
and we'll go. We'll report this story on the basis of what yeah. we know to be true, not what these people are saying in order to stake, take the oxygen out of the room. Right. Well, I mean, I think you know. It, so like I said before, there was a lot to unpack in what you're talking about. I mean, if we're just talking on the psychological level, there's, like I said, the challenge, if you're, not, if you're not someone who really understands that what you're dealing with is malicious intent, then you're trying to answer, even though you may know as a journalist, you may be smart to know there's problems with balance. You know, Fox News uh, bills themselves as fair and balanced, but they're not. And, and so I don't think that it's you know, you have to be very sophisticated as a journalist right now to know there are issues with the concept of balance. But you may be introducing balance where you don't even realize you are. Like if you are analyzing Trump's foreign policy right now, which I just was listening on public radio they were doing, right? And you entertain the idea that he, he is suggesting to pull out of Afghanistan and out of Syria and at the same time doubling down on Iran. And, and, and basically on every single point, directly giving the diametric opposite as what the intelligence um, officials gave at, in their congressional hearings last week. And you say, well, he's naive. You may be introducing a kind of balance there without knowing you're introducing balance because you've, you've now created two polar opposites. Either he's right or he's well-intentioned, but he has it a little bit wrong. Maybe he's following another agenda. You know, you, you, like one minute, they'll be talking about the latest revelations in, you know, the secret meetings between Putin and Trump and, and uh, you know, what we don't know about the Russia investigation. And, th and then they'll change topics and they'll start talking about foreign policy and they'll say, gee, Trump's really naive about foreign policy. But, but isn't the journalist justified in not attributing dark... Uh you know, dark um, motives to Trump sure. on these things. When there is no specific, generally sure. accepted evidence to that effect. Maybe it's coming soon, but so far, I guess you'd have to say no. I mean, there's no significant evidence to suggest that he did this as, a, as a, an, op, an, uh, uh, an active uh, an operator uh, well, as a for, matter for a foreign government. As a matter of pure critical thinking, I think you're right. I th we don't have evidence that, that there's anything malicious. And trying to also, journalists know, trying to reach into somebody's intentions is, is very, especially a politician's intentions, um, is very dangerous territory. But, uh, maybe you're saying that, we, that the journalist has to, has to go beyond just saying, oh, this is naive. He has to raise the issue. Yes. He has to he, say, it's, well, it's it may be naive, thing. but it may not be naive, too. And uh, we have to keep our, our options open on that because we're awaiting the Mueller investigation and other evidence. So it could be this is not naive at all. So it would be wrong to use the term naive without conditioning it. Yeah, I mean, just, be, you know, they need to be careful about how they frame things. But I think that w another reason that this is a challenge for journalists, I mean, they're just facing a lot of challenges in this environment. And is to, is to, to look at it from another direction is that there's these very long-standing professional standards that developed. I mean, it, really, a lot of this roots back to the 1920s, when a lot of this really came to the fore. And you, you first had the uh, American Society newspaper editors and, and the Society Professional Journalists coming up with these codes of professional conduct. But you know, these ideas like of balance or objectivity, the idea that you remove bias, a lot of these were them reaching for ways to define professional standards of journalism. And these are all the more important now because we live in a world of citizen journalism, of cell phones and social media. And, and think so, tech, for that so, matter. You know, so what, disti what distinguishes the professional from the unprofessional? Well, the professional knows how to give balance. The professional isn't going to introduce bias. At the very moment when these things become important or we, we need professional standards, they become very uh troubled ideas because of the reasons we're, dis we're discussing. Well, we only have a little, little time left, Julian. I yeah. do want to cover something you and I spoke about earlier, and, th and that is the, um, the agenda, the agenda, uh, uh, the, the hierarchy uh, of the importance of certain issues. I mean, for example, we agree that climate change is probably the most important issue affecting everyone on the planet today, and we're not talking about it enough. We're not doing enough about it, um, and the press is not, not keeping it at the top of the stack the way perhaps they should, because it is so threatening. At the same time, is just as in a legislative setting, lobbyists come around and seek the attention of the legislators, and that's in many ways how the legislative agenda is set. So there are people who send press releases 
who seek, as Trump does, to you know, have attention from the press and in that way establish the agenda of what's on top and what's not on top. And, you know, if he comes and, um, you know, makes a big shindig about something or other, the press will cover that right. when, in fact, they should be covering something else. He is setting the agenda and others do the same thing. Um, and this is a problem in terms of coverage today. It's a problem in terms of educating a democratic community. So my question to you is, what can we do about that? Is this are we over the Rubicon? Can we come back from that? Can we go back to those old rules and old attitudes about representing all the facts fairly, uh, fitting you know, all the news that's fit to print, uh, and not letting democracy die in darkness or in distraction? That's mine. <laughs> what do we do? I mean, I just see it. You know, you and I have been debating. A lot of this cuts down to what's the problem? What's the fault of it? Like you mentioned lobbyists. People talk a lot about the, the money interference. I, I wouldn't understate any of that. But I, the thing that I go back to over and over is our conventional wisdom, you know, the fact that we have a lot of frames because um, a lot of these people, uh, there's, they're, maybe they're not looking at it in different ways. Maybe, maybe this has to do with the, that we talk about the elite media in some ways that they're removed. They're not getting different ways of looking at this stuff enough. Um, by the way, this idea of setting the agenda, it's, this is a term we use, agenda setting. So the idea originally was, the media may not tell you what to think, but they tell you what to think about. And then that has been updated in terms of like the media tells you how to think about what to uh, think about. They call that agenda setting 2.0 or, or, you know. And, and then the other term that's used that it, for this is framing, right? But like, so you say, well, we don't talk about climate change enough. Well, you know, the way also I look at it is, and we've talked about this, the, the, um, we don't talk about the complete collapse of the global ecosystem enough. We don't talk about, you know, they, they now on CNN, you can see them talking about climate change. It's, it's become part of the, the, the news cycle, at least to a degree. So that's good. Hopefully it'll actually make it into the presidential debates next time, but like for the first time. But like, we don't talk about the mountain of plastic in the ocean or, you know, the complete collapse of, or the, the, the sixth extinction, the, the mass extinction of species. You know, the fact that when you had the heat in Australia, I just heard today that, that bats were, you know, so while we had the polar vortex, you had this scalding heat in, in Australia over the last few weeks, bats were like literally frying to death and, and falling out of the trees. And, I heard that story. And, and, but there are all kinds of reasons why species are going extinct. It's not just climate change. Cl climate change is, you know, there's nutrient pollution, uh, from our sewage systems and from everything that we, all of our agriculture uh, that we dump into the oceans. There's the, there's the infrastructure that we build that wipes out habitat. There's all kinds of assaults so that, you know, my journalism students who are 20, 21 years old, the biggest story of their lifetimes, I think, is going to be not just climate change, but this whole web of life that's falling apart. And you know, that's going to be third, fourth, fifth, sixth on the Democrats, the liberal uh, platform, if we're lucky for the, for the, you know, they're already saying, okay, what's it going to be? Is it going to be, Elizabeth, is it going to be health care? Is it going to be this huge tax cut that they're going to give to working families? Yeah. Well, what happened to the Green New Deal? So that's yeah, now yeah. third or fourth. And then they say, okay, you only have so much political capital. You pretty much only get it your first year as a president in office. So they're going to go for a $32 trillion Medicare thing, or they're going to go uh, for a massive tax cut for working families. Where does the Green New Deal fit into that? And do we really have a, 19, uh, a 2030 deadline, uh, as the scientists say on that? So if they spend all their, if we are lucky enough to get the liberal and they spend all their political capital on, on economic equality, are they going to be able to save the planet by, you know, at, at any time soon? Well, and the, and the idea of the journalist is to serve the public, to serve the common good, to inform people so they'll make good decisions politically. And I mean, frankly, on that issue, I don't think it's happening. And, and so, you know, we're in, we're in desperate straits on that. Imagine with all this new technology, you have virtually hundreds of news items and issues and events that you are exposed to every day, maybe thousands. And more if you want. And then you have all well, We need to talk about the wall. 
right? That's the one that we have to spend all this time talking about. Right, right, right. And, and then you have <laughs> virtually hundreds of right. thousands of platforms that you can get it from. And some are tailored, tailored for you. Yeah. And all would, you know, not Fox News, but the other one and so forth. So you watch what, what you like to hear. And, and the problem with that is that we, we, we never come together on a major, a major decision, a major agenda point like climate change. Now, you know, this is biblical because at the end of the day, 2030, 2040, 2050, we're all going to turn around, assuming we remember that long, and we're going to say, gee, we, we missed out. Now we're at tremendous risk as a planet, yeah. and it's too late to do anything about it. So, you know, right now, I think we're in crisis this way. Yeah. And something in, in the news gathering and this, you know, dissemination system, uh, not only in the U.S., but everywhere, has to be changed if we are going to survive the, the degradation in the environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, we are very rightly, and the press will cover it, and the politicians will talk about electability versus um, integrity Platform, yeah. or, you know, uh, purity, how, how important it is to just, you know, tell it like it is. Um, but, you know, bound up in that is, is that discussion about electability or ideology going to be also about reality? Like if, if we have a hard deadline because of the way the sun goes up and the, you know, and goes down every day because of science and because of the laws of physics of 2030, and we are having a debate about electability or non-electability because of healthcare for all, is, is reality entering into that anywhere and saying, you know, we don't have a 2030, de we, you know, th this is terrible that we don't have healthcare for the people who need it. But do we have a 2030 deadline on that? Like, I think that I, I worry that that in all this discussion of, oh, does it need to be about electability? Does it need to be about, um, you know, uh, our, our purity and our true ideals that we forget what's actually objectively important, you know, as Democrat? I mean, and I'm not even talking about a debate with the right about, you know, which needs to happen about, also. Yeah, about um, Roe v. Wade and silly things. Yeah. You know? I'm just talking about Democrats arguing among themselves, and I just, I don't hear enough concern about, let's get objective for a minute and say, what are our, what are our, what are our priorities need to be because we have genuine global concerns, genuine global problems that we can't just spin or decide, well, I feel this way or that way. So they're, I, put, I put you in uniform as a journalist, and I put yeah. you on the, the floor of the, of the, um, you know, of, of the convention uh, where selections will be made. Yeah. And I give you a, a yellow pad, and I tell you to go talk to them. And the first question is always, what do you think about uh, climate change? What do you think about the environment? And you make them answer that question. Do you have, do you as a journalist, do we as a journalist, as a journalist industry, if you will, community, have the power to change uh, th those, those priorities. Uh, if you ask the question over and over again, if you never take a bad answer, if you always remind them they haven't answered you and that you must have an answer, aren't you in a position to affect, uh, to affect the agenda as it is reported, as the people read it and see it, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, well, I think that I, what I guess I was trying to say is that the media can do a job in terms of framing it. If, if we, we, we seem to be sort of using climate change as a exact synonym for environment, you know, and they're, they're different things. And we have an environmental crisis. We don't just have a climate crisis. And we see that living in Hawaii very much so. So, so there's, there's an onus there on the, on the journalists. But then the other part, if, and I hope I'm answering your question directly not, but the other part of the journalist's role here is that um, we should be demanding that our politicians be leaders and not followers. And so I do think, you know, you were saying, well, we can't expect detailed plans from, from presidential candidates. Well, if they're going to be stumping and getting media attention for over a year, I think the media... Should, should say, we need to see some meat on the bones here. You want to talk about Medicare for all? We need to see details about that. Let's get beyond the bumper sticker and get into how is your plan different than Kamala Harris's plan? How is your, uh, you know, are you saying get rid of private? And they're beginning to, but like with climate change, with the Green New Deal, 
very early on, we, we should be learning stuff here and we should be right away saying, what is that? What, what are your specifics? Mm. How do we get this to actually mm. be real? Mm. What, what's, give us a multi-stage, mm. give us a strategy and put some meat on the bones here. Yeah. You know, we're, gonna, we're not going to cover it if you're just saying what 60 other candidates in the Democratic primary right. are saying. Right, right. You know, and you have answered my question, Julian, and it's, I think it's a great answer. I think it's doable and it will have the desired effect. Just keep on asking him, what's the plan? And ask him, you know, thoughtful, uh, incisive questions about the, the real details, the action points in their platforms and the priorities in their platforms. In that way, I think the press can have an effect. And now's the time to do that. Now, before 2020, now's the time for the press to step up. Ooh, this has been a great discussion. Thank you, Julian, yeah. as always. I hope we can do it again soon. Yeah, thank you. Aloha. How about